Greetings, POS 213 students, Gender Studies, the 2nd of October 2015 at NDU, the Faculty of Law and Political Science. Today we'll be briefly discovering, discussing uh, Rowan Connell's concept of Southern theory uh, and the perspectives of the Global South. Uh, what I would like to show you, and this is from the website, is I've uploaded this here, uh, the conference on the Global South, and what we see here is some of the material that I've put on Facebook for you uh, that I'd like to have a look at, and today, Friday, at 11, uh, you'll be listening to this brief lecture and then uh, discussing things in groups again and giving me, uh, in, your, in your four groups, brief summaries of what is the Global South and what is global theory from a gender studies perspective. What Rowan Col Colin, uh, Connell has done uh, has shown that not only the information is different uh, from the global south, uh, from the global north and the global south, but also the perspective, the way of learning things, the way of knowing things. This goes back to the uh, old adage: as long as lions don't have their own historians. What we'll be doing in uh, the coming semester, in the coming weeks of this semester, is looking how gender studies not only is different from the perspective of men and women, but also the north. In the South. I'd like now to focus on one aspect of her thinking, which is how knowledge is created to serve the interests of the North. What we commonly find as objective is basically the approach to science, not only to logistically serve the North, but also to serve its hegemonic power. So logistically is more simple, which means that research is being done, let's take our region as an example, in the Middle East, and all of you know the Lebanese Emigration Research Center, and most of our research is done because northern research interests ask us to carry out specific tasks for them. Now this in itself has an advantage because it provides us with the context, to do research together with Europeans, with North Americans, etc. Uh, it also provides us with funding, which is also very important. And finally, uh, it provides us with uh, focused research assignments where we can actually gather not only raw data, but integrate it into ongoing research projects. The problem with this is that all of the thinking that goes into this research is done from the perspective of the North. And I'd like to give you an example now uh, taken from the ongoing research that we're doing right now and from the conference I'm at here at Dayton. Uh, this is the conference on human rights, as you can see. And I will be presenting tomorrow a project uh, on uh, on uh, migration in Lebanon and more specifically refugees and the question is how is it possible one for Lebanese government officials for Lebanese communities to deal with 1.5 million uh, Lebanese uh, Syrian refugees in the country Europeans, North Americans find this uh, a puzzle. If they would have even close to that number of, uh, of refugees, that would mean for the United States, for example, that there would be 100 million uh, refugees, let's say from Latin America, arriving in the US over a period of three years. <coughs> the problem with the whole approach is that they use a Western understanding, which is the welfare state, and we'll go into this more in detail, but the welfare state assumes that it's normal 
that the government takes care of the housing, education, health care, uh, interests of the general population. So when refugees come, the refugees have to be taken care of in a similar manner. This is obviously not the case in the Middle East. The government does not take care comprehensively of the social welfare needs of the, of the people, and therefore it is much easier to integrate refugees. This is called counterintuitive. I was just discussing this with some of the uh, colleagues today at the opening of the conference, and they said, wow, the way we see refugee, the development of the refugee crisis in Lebanon is totally centered on our American or European way of dealing with refugees. And this is the point. Uh, so the global north assumes that the way they do things is correct. The global north assumes that a government will take care of all of the interests of the population, thus refugees have to be taken care of. What's the matter? Okay. Why? No. No, stop it. Uh, excuse me, but this is my daughter is the camera woman in this case. Uh, the, 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 the global north assumes that the government takes care of all of the needs of the population, thus they have to take care of all the needs of the refugees as well. This is just one example how global northern perspectives make it impossible to understand the situation in the south. What I would like you to do now is to take the global north perspective uh, that uh, we are aware of from the literature that you've now read. You've read literature on women, you've read, read literature on men, and I'd like you to find out if you can find anything that makes it difficult for them to actually understand the Middle East and the role of men and women. There's no right, again, there's no right and wrong here. There's just uh, sort of, in your case, <coughs> scratching your brain, if you will, to find out where the realities of the Middle East cannot be grasped using gender concepts prevalent in both Europe and North America and both applied to men and women. So, go over this, give me a half a page summary by the end of Friday, and I will be putting up one last video for Monday See you over the weekend. Greetings from Dayton, University of Dayton, here in Dayton, Ohio, and from Yusuf uh, Farhat, a former student at NDU. Goodbye. <laughs>